Oh, oh, I'm Josh. Got it, sorry. Always a good way to start off a presentation. Uh, hi, I'm Josh. Uh, talk to probably most of you between lunch and around the conference. Um, let's see, how do I start off with me? Uh, the first is kind of two mea culpas here. Uh, number one, I'm gonna get really opinionated. Uh, and my opinions are worth exactly what you paid for them, which, depending on your predisposition, is somewhere between zero and whatever you paid for the ticket. So. Um, I apologize if I offend anybody, uh, but I'm gonna give a lot of opinions here. Um, I give a little bit of background uh, on me for a second. Uh, I am a senior developer and test automation architect at a really large computer manufacturer that you probably all know. Um, I actually have two of my junior developers in the audience, so I'm going to try not to suck up here. Um, Part of my job is training junior developers and working with them and developing their skill set. Uh, but before I did that, I worked with the most junior of developers I've ever worked with, and that was me. Because um, I taught myself Python, uh, taught myself most of the programming languages that I know. I don't have a degree in all of this stuff. In fact, I don't have a degree at all. Uh, I worked my way up starting from customer service and call centers, uh, up through being a customer service specialist, working with technical support and escalations. Uh, became a product owner, and now I'm a test automation engineer and a senior automation architect. Uh, it's a fun way to work your way up, and really fun when you go to career day at school and have to explain what kind of degree do you need to do the job that you do. In training people, I've kind of come across a couple of variations of this question. The first one I get is, when should I use a list versus a tuple? Why, why are you using a tuple there? Why aren't you using a list? Or what's, what's the curly braces, but I don't see keys and stuff in there. It's just, what is a set? Um, the second is the question I find myself asking more often, especially in code reviews and stuff. Why everything gotta be a list of dictionaries? I mean, lists are cool and dictionaries are cool, but does everything have to be made of them? Um, so I started looking into this myself, uh, using my background and stuff in there. Uh, the first thing I'm going to level set on is I'm not going to talk about what I call the atomic data types. Uh, that's your floats, your ints, your bools, your strings. Chances are, if you got a question about which of those to use, it's either going to be obvious or the answer is probably not going to matter a whole bunch. Um, these things all have pretty static usages and that, so you're probably not asking that question. Uh, what we're going to talk about is what I tend to call the complex data types. Uh, which are the data structures where you're taking a bunch of these atomic data types and rearranging them in different configurations to have different meanings. The other thing that I'm going to kind of challenge you guys to think about here, um, in my time working in customer service, helping people solve technical support problems, and I probably know how to do unholy things to your TI calculators because I worked with those for so long, um, I, uh, I really got to think about the user experience. Um, user experience is important in everything that we do. Um, and we need to start thinking of our code as a user interface. If you're writing code that only you're ever going to use, it has a really limited shelf life and a really limited utility. So most of the time we're writing things for other people to use, right? Which means we need to write it with other people in mind. Think of that end user that's going to use your code and try to be as kind to that person as you can. So I learned to, use, to, to think a lot about the user experience with all these things, and it kind of led me to this thought when we're talking about data structures. The properties of the data structures that we use send signals to our users on how they should interpret, extend, and use our data. This is important to understand what makes these things similar to each other and different from each other so that you know which one uh, sends the signals that you want to send. Before I dig into all of that, I figured it'd be fun to review what Josh calls his unified theory of good user experiences. And it's really simple, it has three rules and you guys can repeat after me if you want, all right? Is everybody up for this? This is the audience participation portion of the presentation. All right, rule number one, say it with me. Make it obvious. <laughs> if you make something obvious, then the user doesn't have to ask you how to use it because it's obvious. <laughs> They look at it and they know how to use it. Rule number two is, if you can't make it obvious, make it familiar. If I put a random GUI application in front of you and there's something that looks like a toolbar and there's an icon that looks like a floppy disk, what do you guys think that's used for? Did I have to teach you that that means save? 
No, because I'm borrowing from what you know from a whole bunch of other pieces of software. And as long as I say consistent with that, I don't have to teach you how to use it, you already know. This is, by the way, how tropes work in screenwriting. Uh, rule number three is if you can't make it familiar or obvious, for the love of God, make it well documented. <laughs> spend time doing good variable names, spend time doing doc strings, like please be really kind to your users, but don't start at rule three. Rule three is the weapon of last resort. If a user has to go look for your documentation to figure out how to use something, the chances that they're going to use that thing start to go down considerably. So if you can find ways to make it obvious or find ways to make it familiar, that is a better user experience for everybody and more people will use your stuff. All right, so I promised you I'd get into data types, right? So I'm gonna start with Python's three very different bags. Um, lists, sets, and tuples, right? They're all bags, they're all collections. They're all a jumble that you put a bunch of things into uh, so that you can do things with them. The properties of these three different bags, though, are what set them apart, and there's two big properties I'm gonna focus on here. Property number one is mutability or immutability, okay? Is, there, is anybody not clear on what the difference is between mutable and immutable? Mutable means that it can be changed in place. Immutable means that it can't be changed in place. So a string is immutable. If you want to concatenate two strings together, then what happens is a third string is created and string one and two are destroyed if they're no longer used. Mutable data types have their uses and they have their drawbacks. Fantastic, you can modify it in place. If you pass a mutable value to two different functions, they both have access to the same set of data, they can both add to it and remove from it. That can be fantastic or really, really scary. Um, the second property up here is ordered. Um, ordered versus unordered. And here's the epiphany that I had about ordered versus unordered. In an ordered structure, the position of the elements within the sequence is what's used as the locator. In unordered sets, the value is the locator. Make sense? If we're all standing in line at Starbucks, it doesn't matter who the third person is line, in line is, it only matters the third person. And if you're the barista, it only matters who person zero is because they're the next one in line that you gotta take their order for, okay? In an unordered set, you don't care what position people are in. You wanna find Bob, you say, is Bob here? And Bob comes forward. You don't care about where Bob is in line, if he's the first, the last, or somewhere in the hazy middle. You just care about Bob. So, what do I mean when I say all of this fun stuff? I think, Consider using a set if all of the elements that are, that are in there are immutable, they're hashable, um, and you need, the, you need all of the elements to be unique and the order doesn't matter. It's like, whose line is it anyway in there? The points are made up, they don't matter. Um, the position that they are in line doesn't matter, you just care that there's a unique set of them. Use a tuple when you're gift wrapping values to pass to other places. A tuple is really good for when you have a limited scope of data and the position of those data has meaning. So if you're always returning three values and the first value is a name and the second value is a quantity that you have and the third value is a quantity that you need, a tuple is a good way to gift wrap those values so that you can pass them in one go. Does that make sense? Third one is a list. List is really good when order matters, but the number of things that you're gonna have in there are indeterminate, okay? Everybody with me on the three very different bags? Now I'm gonna throw a couple of other extra little bags that Python included in the collections module. And if you haven't dug into collections, there's a couple of really magical structures in there. Uh, the first one I'm gonna talk about is the deck, uh, D-E-Q-U-E. -E. A deck can be used in place of a list when you wanna do one of two things. Number one, you wanna limit the number of elements that can be in there. The deck uh, initializer has a keyword argument called max len. You set it to the number you want, if you go to put, uh, let's say you set the max length at 50 elements, you go to put a 51st element in there, it bumps off the oldest one. What it does, it bumps off the one that's on the other end. So if you're putting it at the, if you're putting in a new element at the end, it kicks off whatever the first one is on top. If you're trying to put a new element on top, it kicks off whatever the one is on the back. The other thing is, is that uh, what a deck is, is it's a double-ended queue. It's sort of like Python's implementation of a, a double, doubly linked list. Um, decks are actually optimized for actions that happen on the beginning or end, but not so much in the middle. So if you wanna use a list as a stack, 
Like you want to use it for linear processing, you're going to put things on the stack and you're going to pull things off the stack. It's a good way to get rid of recursion in some of your programs is to use stack-based processing. A deck is actually marginally faster than a list is, which is really cool. Things you discover. The other one I'm going to talk about is the name tuple. I think these are criminally underused. And this is a good way to add just a little bit of usability into a structure. So look at that first example that I have up there. Can anybody tell me from that value what those two numbers mean? You have no idea unless you go read the documentation and go figure out what the order of those three are. What a name tuple allows you to do is to get all of the functionality of a tuple. You can access values by index. It's uh, immutable and everything. But it also allows you to put names on those fields and allows your users to refer to objects by name instead of by index. This is awesome for creating readability in your software. So if you're using a tuple, consider using a name tuple instead. OK, now we get to the big dog, dictionaries. Um, stole my thunder earlier, because dictionaries are used all over the place. And you're absolutely right. They're magical. I kind of feel like they get overused sometimes. Um, I think dictionaries are best when either A, you're really trying to correlate two pieces of data together. One piece of data that can be uh, uh, identified by value, so is hashable, and the other is just whatever data you're wanting to correlate to. The other thing that I think dictionaries are super useful for is if you have an indeterminate number of keys. So you don't know how many things you're going to stick in there. You're just going to have a lot of things that you're going to be correlating together. It's a good open-ended mutable data structure for doing those kinds of things. right? I think dictionaries are still magical. They're still wonderful. They should be used. They should just be used carefully. How many of you guys have seen a piece of code where you're processing, say, a list of dictionaries, and it's clear from the code that they expect all the dictionaries to have the same set of keys all the time? So they're always looking for the same set of keys. You know, there's, a, there's another more wonderful data structure to use for that, and they're called classes. Uh, but before we get to that, one other, you showed default dict earlier. I think a default dict is wonderful. Uh, it saves you a couple of lines of code. Basically, what the default dict does is allow you to define a default value or a default uh, uh, factory that will spit out new values if you access a key that isn't defined. It saves you the extra lines of code of going, is this key already defined? It's not? OK, put this default value in for me. It takes care of all that for you. It does. And Keep in mind what you're optimizing for. If you're optimizing for performance, you're right, a default dict might not be the fastest way to go. If you're wanting simplicity and readability of code, this cuts down on the amount of code that you have to write. Remember that every line of code that you write is a line of code that has to be read, understood, maintained, and eventually decommissioned. Code is terrible, and we should have as little of it in our product as possible. <laughs> All right, so we talked about classes. Classes I like for adding uniformity. So if you find that you are uh, wanting dictionaries to all have the same keys, maybe that's what a class is for. You set the attributes that you want on there. It contains everything that you need. You can call vars on any instance object and get its dictionary that's inside if you really want a dictionary. Um, that's what classes are for. Classes are also useful for sticking functions on there, sticking actions. I had the most difficult time understanding object-oriented code, because before here, I came through Pascal in high school. Uh, I worked in AutoIt for a while, which is sort of object-oriented, but not quite. Uh, I worked with VBScript for a long time. That's a dark period we don't talk about anymore, uh, until I finally came to Python. Um, object-oriented programming, I could not wrap my head around it for the longest time. My best friend would explain it to me by going, it's just drawing circles around your code. And that still didn't help me. I like to think of it this way. Your objects are, are, are people. They have a function. They do a job for you. Um, what a class is and what an object is, is it's a state, a set of values, and then it's actions that perform on those values. Right? So it's data with purpose. The Python 3 introduced an extra little thing that I think is super useful, and that's the data class decorator. Um, data class decorator does a lot of the job of generating a lot of the boilerplate for you. 
So you don't have to write your dunder in it. You don't have to write your dunder string, your dunder rep, or your dunder equal, uh, and all of that. The data class takes care of all that for you. And all it asks that you do is set up class level fields and put uh, type annotations on them. And from that, it can create everything else that you need. Data classes are fantastic as an alternative to a dictionary if you need a rigid structure on your data. The data classes module even has a function called as dict that you can pass at any data class instance and it will give you the dictionary. Super useful. So hopefully I've given you a couple of good ideas and a couple of guidelines to kind of play by. Um, I generated all these slides uh, in a markdown framework called MARP, um, which takes markdown and converts it into slides. Uh, in my GitHub repo, you'll find both this and a cheat sheet, which kind of has more details on the properties of each of the data types, uh, along with my suggestion of when to use them and some code examples and stuff in there. Uh, of course, because I work in test automation, my slides repo has a CI that automatically generated my slides for me because I couldn't come up here in good faith and tell you I work in automation without applying some automation to my own workflow. So, any questions? Stunned silence. I love it. Very cool. All right, well, I hope to talk to some of the rest of you guys uh, that I haven't talked to yet around. Thank you.